Well, hello world. Welcome to the first annual Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Virtual Academy and Inspirathon. I'm Stephen Wood, the director of the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law in the University of British Columbia on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation in Vancouver, Canada. This is the second session of the Academy, and we are privileged in this session to be joined from Sydney, Australia, by Justice Brian Preston, who is the Chief Judge of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, one of the world's most progressive and uh, renowned environmental courts. As I get underway with introductory remarks, I would just like to uh, invite everybody to introduce yourselves in the chat and to indicate uh, where you are dialing in from, including um, which Indigenous people hosts you on its traditional territory, if that's applicable. Um, I'd also encourage you to turn on um, your videos so we can see each other. We set this up as a Zoom meeting rather than as a webinar to make it a more interactive experience. Uh, and uh, it's nice to see faces. Um, so this session is being recorded. The recording will be available on the uh, website of the Academy. Uh, Justin's, just, sorry, Justice Preston's talk will be followed by commentary by Professor Sharon Masher of the University of Calgary, and then by audience Q&A. Um, we invite you to post your questions in the chat as we go along, or you can save them up until the end. Um, and uh, since we're doing this in a more interactive, uh, informal format, um, we would even like to give you the opportunity to ask questions uh, yourself, uh, to speak your questions um, by uh, unmuting uh, microphone and talking. So uh, when the time comes, we'll give you the opportunity uh, to do that. The, this public session, uh, the sort of formal uh, uh, part of the session, is going to be followed by an informal at the kitchen table chat for those of you who signed up in advance uh, to do that. Um, and that will take place in a different Zoom room that has uh, its own separate Zoom link that has already been sent to the folks who signed up to do that. Um, I'm now going to introduce our commentator, who will then in turn introduce Justice Preston. Sharon Masher joined the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary around a dozen years ago, um, before which she was a professor at Thompson Rivers University Faculty of Law in the interior of British Columbia, and an associate professor and De deputy director, environment and climate change, uh, of the Center for Mining, Energy and Resources Law at the University of Western Australia Faculty of Law. He's also held academic positions in faculties of law at Victoria University Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in the University of Saskatchewan. She was for eight years co-editor of Canada's premier environmental law journal, the Journal of Environmental Law and Practice, She's currently a review editor for Frontiers in Climate, Climate Law and Policy, and a climate government, sorry, climate governance expert with um, the Canadian Climate Law Initiative. While in Australia, Sharon was a member of the management committee on the, of the Environmental Defenders Office, Western Australia, a not-for-profit uh, legal clinic dedicated to environmental protection. She also served as a principal policy officer for the Greenhouse Unit in Western Australian Department of Environment and Conservation, as a legal consultant to the Western Australia Department of Water, and a member of the Western Australia Water and Rivers Commission Legislative Compliance Advisory Group. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sharon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor to have you. And uh, I'll let you introduce Justice Preston. Thanks very much, Stefan. Um, good afternoon to everyone and, and good morning to Justice Preston. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. That includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sitsika, the Bigani, and the Gainai First Nations. 
the Tsutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda uh, First Nations, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, the featured warrior lawyer for this session, His Honor Justice Brian Preston. Um, to many joining this session, Justice Preston needs no introduction. As Chief Justice of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales since 2005, a specialist environmental court that's, as Stephen said, widely regarded as one of the most innovative in the world. The influence of his many groundbreaking judgments have been felt well beyond New South Wales and beyond Australia and indeed around the world. And despite the enormity of that judicial uh, contribution and his influence in that capacity, just recognizing his role there doesn't begin to capture the, the uh, scope of his contributions in the development of environmental law. In fact, before joining the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, Justice Preston was a senior counsel practicing in New South Wales in the area of environmental planning, administrative and property law. I believe he was at the Environmental Defenders Office at one point. He, for over 30 years, has lectured in postgraduate environmental law courses. He's an adjunct professor to three Australian universities. And um, in what, as an as a academic who feels stretched all the time, uh, blows my mind, he has also written Australia's first book on environmental litigation and over 144, and I presume counting, um, journal articles, book chapters, and reviews on environmental law, administrative law, and criminal law. He holds numerous editorial positions in environmental law publications, and he's been involved in several international environmental consultancies and capacity building programs, particularly with the judiciary throughout Asia, Africa, and the European Union. So perhaps uh, if there's time left, we can get some uh, time management tips from Justice Preston to figure out how it is he manages to do it all. But for now, um, I'll turn it over to Justice Preston, who's going to share with us his thoughts on advancing public interest litigation for the planet. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be able to uh, present. It's a great idea that what you're having, um, I'm not sure that the, uh, the Eco Warriors uh, label being applied to me, but certainly I have worked in environmental law and public interest litigation uh, all of my uh, working life. So it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, share some uh, tips. So I'm just going to now share my uh, screen to so, uh, make a PowerPoint presentation up. Good. So, as the uh, the title, uh, what I want to try and explain and use the knowledge that I've acquired over uh, more than 40 years uh, of working in this area uh, about how we can bring public interest litigation uh, for uh, to save the, the planet and uh, its people. So, grouping the uh, my tips for successful public interest litigation, uh, um, they're chronologically arranged. Uh, with these titles. So getting to go, uh, not where we don't pass go, and then from the get go, uh, from go to woe, and uh, too far gone. So let's get to go. Uh, as we know, in the uh, Monopoly board game, uh, they, everyone begins uh, at the space go. So how do public interest litigation uh, commence? Well, uh, we uh, commence uh, by plaintiffs filing whatever is the originating process uh, in a court. Uh, I call it the end game uh, around the board game because often uh, it is part of a comprehensive strategy. There might be public protest, there may have been uh, participation at various stages, uh, but uh, the decision is made that uh, litigation is needed as one of the strategies 
uh, to be uh, pursued. But when you come to uh, file the originating process to commence the proceedings, there has been a process of preparation that started a long time before. That is, you don't go to court and file proceedings until uh, you've done a lot of homework. So what is that preparation that needs to be, be done? Well, I'm grouping the uh, ideas uh, in these uh, five. You first, you've got to have willing and able plaintiffs. Second, you've got to have knowledgeable experience of willing lawyers uh, to act in the case. Uh, you've got to have an appropriate claim or cause of action. Uh, no amount of zeal or uh, enthusiasm uh, gets you over the line in a legal claim. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have to have evidence to prove your case. Uh, but doing all of those things means you need uh, financial resources. And so you have to have uh, some way of being able to fund the litigation. So let's start with the, the first of those uh, preparatory steps, and that is uh, finding willing and able plaintiffs. So you have to find citizens or groups uh, who are willing and are able to bring uh, the litigation. And when I talk about willingness, it, it's a, a product of not only enthusiasm and zeal for the environmental cause, but also it's a cultural attitude. Because public interest litigation is a form of protest. It's challenging powerful interest in the government and the private sector. And not all people are prepared to take that on. And especially around the world, there are places where uh, protest uh, civil society, by civil society, including litigation, uh, is uh, frowned upon or worst, uh, uh, there's a crackdown on it. And people, you know, we have the rival defenders being uh, murdered, uh, people being put in prison uh, for uh, protesting or bringing uh, public goods to litigation. So there is a, it needs to be a culture in the particular country that enables uh, the bringing of this. And people have to be prepared uh, to take on this form of uh, protest. Now, ability is uh, a product of having knowledge and experience in the environmental problem, the subject of the litigation. Uh, whilst the work will be done by the, uh, the lawyers, the experts, uh, those people who are professionals, nevertheless, the client needs to have knowledge and experience in it. They can't be completely uh, ignorant of the, the problem. They need to give the instructions. They need to think about strategies as well. And they have to have the capacity to access the human financial and material resources in order to be able to bring the litigation. So they have to say, who are the experts that they can connect with? Who might be prepared to give their uh, time for free? What might be the lawyers that uh, would be prepared to do this? Uh, or where can we raise some funds? Do we know some philanthropic trusts or uh, funders, or uh, do we have the ability to raise the finance in various ways? But you also have to have the attributes, the personal attributes of dedication, perseverance, resilience. Uh, as we all know, uh, in uh, environmental activism, uh, it's hard work and people do get burnout. Uh, and you have to have that capacity to keep going. Uh, it's a stressful environment, litigation, and people have to know that and be prepared uh, to settle in for the long term uh, when litigation is being run. And of course, there also is the uh, criticism that will come uh, whether there is success at the end of the day or failure at the end of the day. Uh, people, because it is uh, challenging uh, those with power, uh, there will be a backlash against the, uh, the people who bring this action and uh, people have to be prepared uh, to uh, suffer that. Then we come to the lawyers. Uh, it, it, again, uh, having zeal and enthusiasm is important, but it doesn't run successful litigation. I remember when I was first... Um, uh, I was an associate to a, a, a law clerk to a, a Supreme Court judge and uh, you know, talked about various going to the bar and doing things. And what uh, that judge emphasised was that you can't do the right thing by 
a particular cause, an environmental cause, uh, by just having that enthusiasm. You have to be at the top of your game. You've got to be a really knowledgeable lawyer, skillful, uh, know how to uh, you know, bring the litigation, succeed as an advocate. That, uh, those skills are what are needed uh, for plaintiffs. Uh, he, he doesn't uh, cut the mustard just to turn up and say, I really want this uh, outcome. You've got to really show how it can be done. Yeah. So the lawyers not only have to be that experienced and knowledgeable, they've got to also be willing to take on the case. Uh, and that could be at no fee, uh, or it could be on a reduced fee basis. I'll come to that later. Now we come to the claim, and this is you know, absolutely important. Uh, and too often I see uh, a litigation brought uh, for a uh, worthy cause uh, to protect some aspect of the environment or to advance some environmental uh, issue, uh, but they've chosen the, the inappropriate claim. It's almost like dooms of success. It's really important to choose uh, the right claim. So I'm giving some tips here about uh, what should be uh, factors that are taken into account in choosing the appropriate claim. And I'm gonna run through those. The first is the, the litigant, the plaintiff has to be the activist. Uh, the court is responsive uh, to the claims brought before them. Well, if there are some courts, such as in southern India, uh, India it would be a good example, where the courts are pre uh, prepared to move suamoto, that is, on their own motion, that is the exception. Uh, courts, uh, especially in you know, countries like Australia and Canada, uh, will be responsive to the claims that are brought before them. So it's the plaintiffs who have to be the activists. They're the ones who've got to come up with the ideas uh, and the claims and put it before the court. Now, that doesn't mean to say that, um, you know, courts are passive, that they're just responding to what's put, uh, put before them. They can be active, and I use that word as opposed to activist. That is, they're, they're not being um, uh, passive, they're being active. Once the, the claim is put before them, they can develop uh, environmental jurisprudence, they can solve the environmental problems according to uh, law and legal method. The second tip is uh, to um, be creative. Um, and so, I'm sorry, there on my image, <laughs> the, um, the picture has dropped down over my text. I hope it's not that way when you look at it. But uh, uh, so don't get stuck in a rut. Don't do what has always been done. So think broadly and uh, across boundaries. So when we think about not getting stuck in the ruck, we see that with climate litigation. There was a time where the same types of claims were being brought all around uh, in countries. And I think it was Albert Einstein who uh, is at least attributed with saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. And litigants can fall into that category. If you uh, bring a claim uh, in a particular way before a particular court and fail, then unless you do something to change, either the claim or the way in which you bring the claim or the court that you go to, you might well end up having the same result the second time or the third time or the fourth time, right? It, it, you don't wear courts down uh, uh, like by attrition. So think outside the square uh, and across boundaries. So when we're thinking about broadly, when we think about what is environmental law, it's really all law that can achieve environmental goals. It's not just planning and environment law. It's not natural resources law. It's not mining law. Yes, that's part of environmental law, but it's many more things. So when we think about administrative law, it's all aspects of administrative law or constitutional law or human rights law. Or let's go into tort. Don't just think about the, you know, the traditional ones of nuisance, for example. Think about you know, conspiracy or deceit or misrepresentation. What about contract law? Where are the contract law cases for greenwashing? Why aren't they being brought? They could be very effective. Uh, property law, 
Obviously, there are some cases about public trust, the atmospheric public trust cases by our children's trust in um, the United States would be an example. But what about in real property? Climate change is going to have an effect on real property. Starting to think about that. What about misrepresentation? Selling uh, coastal land that is subject to um, you know, climate change induced events. It could it be said that there is misleading and uh, representations as to the suitability of that land? Uh, what about in trade practices and consumer law? Same idea. And then, of course, moving into corporations law, starting to think what are the director's duties of care? And once you start thinking that way, we can start saying, well, environmental law, when you're bringing an action, can be in any of these areas, in any of those um, claims. And the other one I said was, you know, cross boundaries, look over the horizon. What we're seeing with environmental law, it's becoming increasingly globalized and harmonized. So don't just uh, think of what we've done before in our own jurisdiction. Look at international law. Can you take ideas that are developing in international law and incorporate them into domestic law? Can you look at other countries' laws uh, and or litigation? in international national courts and, and other fora. Can we use ideas there in our own law, right? They can be the inspiration. And what we're seeing now is what I referred to as the ripple effect of you know, overseas judicial decisions. So the agenda litigation in the Netherlands had a ripple effect, not only in countries in Europe, uh, Belgium, for example, but elsewhere. And my own decision in Gloucester Resources has been picked up, including uh, by the Supreme Court in Canada. Uh, it was referred to there. So you can see this uh, idea that there can be a ripple effect across boundaries. Now, I've said about being the activist, but I also want to say that we need to uh, show the courts uh, what to do, uh, how and how to do it. So I'm saying that it's the plaintiff has not only got to be the activist, they've got to be the leader. They've got to sort of take the court by the hand, show them what is this particular claim and how the court can uphold it. By definition, public interest litigation is uh, not applying settled law. It's pushing the boundaries. It's trying to say, let's move the law into a new area. Let's apply it to a new situation. Uh, the court hasn't done that before. So how do you get them to do that? You show them the way. And so just making a bare appeal to what's right, what's just, what's fair, is never going to uh, uh, assist the court to get to where you want them to be. And I've said about you've got to find uh, the right vehicle, and that is the, the, the claim. So it's, it's not only the cause of action, but you've got to have the right facts for that. You know, too often we see, well, this was a good idea, but the facts just don't support uh, the court uh, finding the plaintiff's way on these facts. And it's so frustrating, I can say as the judge, to have a claim which is a good claim, but it's, it, you just can't get that claim up on the facts. So make sure that you've got the right facts to be able to establish the claim that you've chosen and to obtain the appropriate relief. Now, when we, we think about it, uh, we apply the law and we uh, are going to apply the facts. And hopefully you do that through an intellectual and rational process. But contrary to popular perception, judges are human. They have emotions, right? They want to wake up and, and think that they've done the right thing and not done the wrong thing. And so there needs to be some sort of emotive hook you think about it in popular songs, there is that sort of, you know, uh, hook catchy uh, one, uh, which keeps resonating in your ear. Well, you want to have an emotive hook uh, for this case. You want to bring the judge around. Why? Well, because in every single case, there are what I call leeways of choice. There are leeways of choice in what it, finding what is the law to be applied, how to interpret that law. Or in looking at the evidence, what facts to find? And then how do you apply the law to the facts? Or even if you find a breach of the law, what remedy should you give? And there's a discretion whether to give a remedy. So 
the judge is going to find your way on the law and find your way on the facts and apply the law to the facts to find a breach and to give the rep you know the appropriate remedy if they are hooked on the case right they believe that is the right thing to do if they don't believe it's the right thing to do you're never going to get them to make those leeways of choice so you've got to think of that. It's, a, it, it's a, almost like a psychology of uh, litigation, and you've got to think of that. Now, the other thing, of course, is you, if you might find a claim and you might establish it, but if you've got the wrong remedy, then you're going to fail. So it's no good, for example, bringing an action where, say, like a common law action where the the, the usual remedy is damages if there are no damages to be proven. Or conversely, bringing an action for um, uh, in a common law action where damages is the usual remedy, but what you really want is an injunctive uh, order, you know, to stop certain action or to compel uh, uh, the defendant to take certain action. Right? So you've got to make sure that the, the remedy that you want and that is the best uh, or the most appropriate for the circumstance, is able to be granted in that particular claim. If it's not, then you've got the wrong claim. You need to change the claim and go for one where it, you can get the remedy you want. But we also need to remember that sometimes uh, the remedy is not what you get in court. It may be what comes later. So in judicial review, for example, the remedy you get in court is, for example, to quash or declare invalid uh, an administrative decision. But that's not really what you want. What you want is to them to make the right decision the next time around. So this may be a step along the way, and you have to have a public campaign, a protest, which will persuade the decision maker to make the right decision the next time. That's not a remedy you can get in court. The court can't compel the, the decision maker to exercise a discretionary power in a particular way. They can only say, no, the way they all have already uh, decided it is wrong in law and set it aside, but they can't compel what the new decision would be. You have to bring separate uh, protest or uh, public campaign in order to persuade the decision maker to make the decision that you want them to make. The other aspect is to avoid the scattergun approach. We all know what that is. You know, you get the sort of uh, the scattergun, which have multiple bullets. Uh, it, it fires, you know, 20 shots like buckshot. Uh, you haven't a clue what you're trying to hit, but hopefully one of those little uh, shots is going to hit it. It's always a disaster because the message it says to the court is this, this plaintiff doesn't know what their best claim is uh, and they're just sort of uh, saying, you never know your luck in the big city. You just might happen to succeed. Uh, that's the wrong message. So pick your good points and stick to them. Have conviction in what are your good points. Uh, you may not succeed, but you've got to show them that they are your good points. Uh, if you've got plenty of poor arguments, I can tell you it deflects attention uh, from and often taints the good arguments when you make them. The court sort of says, you know, pox on all your houses, this is hopeless, uh, and, you know, dismiss it. And a good point just gets thrown out with uh, the bad points. All right, what else? We've, we've got our um, plaintiffs and we're lawyers and we've got our claims, etc. Uh, now we have to prove our case. And we've got to remember that's an absolutely essential uh, one. A claim is just what you're articulating uh, as being uh, the bare bones. You've got to prove that with evidence. And you need good evidence. So what are you going to need evidence about? Well, obviously, whatever is your claim or cause of action. You break that up into each of the elements of that cause of action, each of the things you need to prove in order to establish the breach of law. But of course, you also have to prove that you are entitled to the relief that you've claimed. Uh, a lot of people go put a lot of effort into proving breach of the law and not sufficient effort into proving how they should get the relief uh, that they're claiming. Then you have to think about uh, how you put that evidence together. 
And so you can call witnesses of fact, you can call expert witnesses, you can have documents that could be the ministry record, business records, photographs, videos, whatever it is. Uh, you can uh, give a notice uh, to admit facts to the defence and then put in those admissions. You can give interrogatories, you can have depositions, uh, you can get all of those answers. Uh, one has to have a multi-pronged approach uh, to putting the evidence together. But above all, there must be a, a focus on ensuring uh, evidence is of the highest quality, it is reliable, and it will be admissible. Again, just getting because, oh, this person is a, uh, a committed campaigner who happens to be an expert, uh, that evidence is not going to persuade the court. Uh, they need to be the very best experts. Let's put a bit more light here. Um, sorry. Um, okay. Elizabeth, can you just come and put the light on, please? Um, so um, to make sure uh, that uh, we are going to prove the case. The next one is having finances to do so. So uh, unfortunately, all litigation is expensive. It runs from the preparation of all of the things that I've said uh, through the running of the case uh, right to the end. And so how do you do it? Well, you've got to find a plaintiff who's able to raise the funds or has got the funds. You can use litigation funders, but they're not always available. Uh, you can ask for legal aid, but again, that's now rarely available. You can go to public interest legal centres. A number of universities have clinics uh, and they can, you know, use um, a tap into those uh, to get assistance, particularly with preparation, finding experts, putting that evidence together. You can get lawyers or experts to work on a sort of a no win, no fee basis or a reduced fee basis or a no fee basis. And then in some uh, jurisdictions, it used to be in Ontario, I don't think it still is, there was a capacity for intervener funding. All right, so that was all before we got to go, all right, a lot of work. But that's because uh, cases are won and lost before you go to court. It, 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 you have to do that work beforehand. All right, there are some things you need to think about which may prevent you ever getting past go hopefully not going to jail. So the two big ones that we see in litigation are justiciability and standing. So justiciability is also called in America the political uh, question doctrine. Uh, it involves uh, whatever your claim or cause of action is, having the quality of being capable of being considered legally and being determined by the application of legal principles and techniques by the courts. Now, uh, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about what justiciability is. It's not about whether it raises political questions. That's why it is a misnomer for the Americans to say that it's the political question doctrine. It actually leads people down the wrong path, right? All public interest litigation raises political questions. There are value judgments to be done. That's not a reason for the court uh, not having the jurisdiction uh, to determine a, uh, a claim or cause of action. But if a claim uh, is not justiciable, then the court doesn't have jurisdiction. And so, therefore, there will be uh, a risk of the claim being struck out at the outset. And we've seen that in a number of the climate litigations, particularly in America. Um, so that means that one has to anticipate this action by the defence and say, make sure that not only is it a justiciable claim, but in the pleading of it, you make sure that it's seen to be justiciable, right? Don't leave it to chance. Uh, make sure you show why it is justiciable. And the other strikeout uh, at the outset uh, is uh, concerned standing. So we all know what standing is. It's, a, it's the right of a particular person or group to bring the particular claim or cause of action. So standing obviously depends on the identity of the person, but it also depends on the type and subject matter of the proceedings and therefore the relationship of the first, the, the identity of the person, with that type and subject matter of proceedings. 
So different people may have standing to bring the same proceedings. And you have to match the person with the claim. Uh, and that's important. So it, in making the choice about which plaintiff you're going to select, you have to say, will I succeed in showing that that person has standing? Now, sometimes you can hedge your bets. And so you can have multiple plaintiffs. And Tony Opposa, one of the eco warriors who's going to talk, did this in the sort of marine mammals case, in, in, um, but also in the in Vanilla Bay case, where there are multiple plaintiffs. Some people who clearly will have standing, for example, uh, uh, you know, fisher folk, uh, who will, um, the economic, uh, uh, livelihood will be, will be affected, but also, you know, less obvious uh, plaintiffs where you're wanting to push the boundary, the fish and marine mammals themselves, for example. Uh, that way, even if the court were to say that the fish and marine mammals don't have standing, they, you still got a plaintiff uh, who will have standing and therefore the uh, proceedings are able to be litigated. But that serves the purpose that you can push the boundaries, but with a fallback solution. All right, that's my uh, second category. Now we've, we've got to go and we want to get going uh, as the uh, colloquial says, saying goes from the get go. So I said that um, successful litigation depends on case preparation and anticipating and addressing the defence to the case. So cases are won or lost before the trial. So the first thing you have to do is come up with a case theory. Now, case theory is a particular strategy that's going to guide the conduct of the case to achieve the realistic outcomes. Case theory is different to the claim or cause of action. Of course, case theory depends upon the claim or cause of action, but it's how you are going to articulate that particular claim or cause of action that you've chosen. How are you going to prove it? How are you going to persuade the court? And I say here that when we talk about advocacy, what is advocacy? Advocacy is simply persuasion. Advocacy, good advocacy is persuading the trier of fact, the court, uh, to uh, uphold your particular claim and give you the outcome you claim. And so the, your case theory has to inform everything you do from the get-go, uh, your uh, pre-trial procedure and your conduct of the case in court. And so I've said about showing the way you show the court through your case theory what is uh, the judgment that you want them to give and the outcome that you want them to order. So the first is uh, you have to establish the law. So this involves two steps. You've got to find what the law is and interpret the law that you've found. So you may say, oh, hang on a second. What's the difficulty in finding the law? Remember I said, in public interest in litigation, environmental litigation, we're dealing with hot law, hot situations. The law that you're asking them to apply to the, the situation is not what has been done in the past. You're asking them to do something new, novel in the future. So therefore, you've got to say, what is this new law that you're asking them to apply? And you, show, and you need to show them how they can develop that law. So if you're taking something like tort, we know what the elements of a particular tortious claim is, a cause of action, but you're trying to show them how that can be applied in a new way, in a way that it hasn't been done before. So if we think about the atmospheric um, trust, um, public trust cases, or in the, you know, applying, um, you know, nuisance to deal with uh, you know, pollution of the atmosphere by greenhouse gas emissions, then you're trying to show them how to do, push the boundaries of tort law in a way that they haven't done before. Or even if you're applying a statute, you have to say how they should interpret that statute in a way that they haven't applied before. You've found the law, you've interpreted it, you've now got to prove the facts. You've got to prove every single element. So what I used to do was create a master chart of evidence. I would put on the first column each of the elements of whatever is the claim or cause of action. I would then break that up 
So if it was in negligence, for example, you have to prove duty of care, breach of duty of care, damage, damage flowing from uh, the breach. But then you'd break that up. So it's not just proving that there is a duty of care. What is the content of that duty of care? It's not just that there's been a breach, but what were the particular uh, aspects of breach? You break that up into the sub-elements. Then you say, how do I prove each of those sub-elements? Is it going to be by oral evidence? Is it expert evidence? Is it documents? Is it admissions? Is it, you know, uh, answers to interrogatories? How are you going to prove that? Is I'm going to get that in cross-examination? Uh, and so you put that into category, how are you going to prove each of that? That way you make sure that you prove every fact that is needed. And then you have to say how the law that you've found and interpreted uh, should be applied to the facts that you ask the court to find. It's a, it, it, it's a syllogistic reasoning process where you apply the law, which is the major premise, to the facts, which is the minor premise, to establish the breach of law. But that's not enough. As I said, you've got to prove that there, uh, a remedy should be granted for the, dis for the breach of the law. And there are very few cases where it's mandatory for a court to grant relief. Mostly there is a discretion and you've got to show the court why they should grant the relief that you seek. You also then need to think what is going to be the defence uh, to the case. So what arguments are they going to uh, raise? How do you preempt or rebut those? So what are they going to say about the elements of the cause of action? What are they going to say? Is there a defence to that? What is the, uh, if they're going to say that they will be prejudiced if the remedy were to be granted, uh, then what is your answer to that? I know. We then go uh, in our sort of from go to woe. So we've gone through the case of preparation and on to the trial. And so one of the things I emphasize is that you don't just think about once you file it and then we'll come up to the trial and there's a sort of interregnum where you don't need to worry. You've got to look about that every time you do any attendance in the court or you file any document, that is an opportunity to persuade. And what is persuasion? Persuasion is about showing the sort of ineluctability of success of your claim. You've got to be not only uh, uh, appearing a winner, you've got to show how you're a winner all the time. The court gets caught up in the enthusiasm and the logic uh, of the claim, and you've got to see it. So your pleadings uh, have got to show why this claim is uh, effective. Every time you appear at an interlocutory occasion, you're before a court, uh, it may be the trial judge, you try to persuade them there. And so a lot of people miss this opportunity and think that oh, we've got a bit of downtime here. It's not. It's really critical. So from the time the judge walks onto the bench to start the trial, they believe you are going to win. That's the what they must know from the time they walk on. Not, oh, what's this case all about? No, you've missed your opportunity. So now we're at the trial. Uh, how do you do it? Opening the case is critical. Opening the case is not just a pedestrian run through about reading your brief uh, to the court, about sort of reading affidavits or tendering documents and taking them in a mind numbingly boring manner through. You've got to show them why it is that you are going to win this case and how there could be no other result. That's what you've got to have that confidence uh, in presenting it. And think about how you put that forward. Don't just do it, as I say, in a very boring pedestrian way. Think about, do you want to have a table? Do you want to have a chart? Do you want to have photographs? Do you want to have a PowerPoint presentation? Do you want to show a video? How is it that you're going to do it? You know, I say this is the emotive hook, but you've got to try and get them in to see how it is that you are going to, to, to win. I used to, I talked about preparing a particular chart of evidence for preparation. I used to use that chart in my opening. I would show, uh, say to the, the judge, um, to win in this case, I will need to show you one, two, three. I'm going to be able to show you that through this. And this is how we're going to do it. The law supports this proposition. 
I'll prove the facts which support this proposition in this way. And so at the end of it, they know exactly uh, where we're heading and why we're heading that way and how it is that we will get to the result that I say. And so that means that you are always ready at the trial. Uh, you've anticipated everything that's going to happen and it runs like clockwork. You have every witness ready to call. Uh, you know the questions you're going to ask them. If it's reading affidavits, you read them and you have them ready. If it's documents, you deal with it. If it's objections to your evidence, you're ready to deal with it. As I say, you've got to cultivate the ineluctability of victory. And you've got to keep a momentum running through the hearing. You start it hot and you've got to continue that right through. There never is a pause. And so the judge gets uh, swept along with the, uh, this enthusiasm and the ineluctability of victory in the case. But all the time, you, you maintain this aura of calm, competence and control. You stay on message uh, throughout the hearing. You don't in, engage in tactics or sledging. And insofar as the other side try to put you off your game, you don't get diverted or distracted. You just give them a wry smile, Mona Lisa-like, and you just move on. Uh, because you must maintain control of the agenda. It's your case, you run it. You don't get put off. If you give in to sledging by the other side, they've seized control of the, the litigation uh, and, and you lose that uh, momentum. You always got to be um, adaptive. And so in environmental governance, we talk about adaptive management. So you can have a feedback loop. How is your case going? Uh, what is the judge saying? Did your evidence collapse? Uh, you never show that it collapsed, but you, you recognize when it does. And you say, what is your response to that? And you keep adapting your legal argument, the way you evidence you're calling uh, to uh, adjust the emphasis to uh, uh, manage what is happening at the trial. When you come to your closing address, then you should have anticipated and addressed every one of the court's concern or what happened in the trial. If your evidence didn't proceed as you had anticipated, you've adapted and you say how it's going to be done. So you say, I said this in opening, uh, I can continue saying it here, or here is my adjustment in closing. Again, I said, show the way. You've got to make it easy for the court to uphold the, uh, your claims. You've got to show the court how to draft the judgment. Don't just leave it to them to try and work that out. So facts, you provide a summary of the facts uh, that you say uh, should be found. And you, you cross-reference that to the evidence on which they're based. And you make it easy for the judge to make those findings of fact. And so you can do that with a compendium of extracts of key documents, transcript, evidence, et cetera, annotate it and give them, these are the findings of fact we want you to find. And as far as the law, you have to show them. These are the legal propositions uh, we want you to find. Here is the, the case law that supports that. It may not be have found that law in a previous case because you're pushing boundaries, but you show how that is a logical extension of those um, findings that have been made in previous authorities. And you show the court how to apply that law to the facts. Uh, insofar as you're crossing boundaries, you're going to overseas jurisprudence, then you give them copies of the, the judgment and you show how it is uh, that those courts uh, decided that and how the, this court, the one you're arguing at, uh, can adapt those foreign decisions uh, to the case at hand. And I come to my last category, and, and that is notwithstanding uh, following all my tips, you fail, right? You get a judgment, you're unsuccessful. Does that mean that all is lost? No. You can never, if you're pushing boundaries, no public interest litigation, I'm oh, sorry, all public interest litigation is never going to be successful. You always know that you're going to lose, right? There is a risk factor uh, in some cases. But you can still use that lack of success. How? Firstly, it can still influence and change behaviour, either of the government 
uh, the government may uh, pick up on what has been said by the court or what's been argued, or the private sector, right? They can uh, uh, still adjust their behaviour because they know there's a risk the next time they may be found liable. But you also can say, well, what's my next claim? How, what can I learn from what happened last time? How do I adjust the claim? Do I pick a different course of action? Do I pick a different court? Do I uh, choose different evidence? What is the learning, uh, the lesson to be learned from that particular loss? Um, and you also got to remember that unsuccessful public litigation is uh, part of an overall campaign. Uh, and so it can raise public awareness, which can change social uh, consciousness. It can raise, for example, climate consciousness. So hopefully those um, tips do give you some idea of what can be done uh, to be a, a successful uh, eco-warrior in court. Thank you. Justice Preston, thank you for that compelling uh, roadmap for effective public interest litigation. Um, I'll hand it over now to Sharon Masher, who will have some thoughts and a commentary. Go ahead, Sharon. Oh, we're not hearing you. We were hearing you before, but not now. No. Let me try to mute and unmute. Not hearing you. Is that any better? We hear you. All right, great. <laughs> Um, all right, sorry about that, everyone. Thank you so much, Justice Preston, for that really useful um, roadmap that you have provided us as we think about um, how we as academics engage with our students um, and as lawyers engage with the law in undertaking what is um, the project of collectively advancing the law. I just want to... Um, I just want to um, go from where you're um, left us to think about what the role of the court is once all of this good work has been done and how it is that not an activist court, but an active court um, responds in a way that helps develop the law um, and advance our collective understanding of, of how we um, make the law fit for purpose in light of some of the big environmental challenges that we are facing. And I thought I would just reflect on a few of Justice Preston's um, judgments to make the point of how it is that an active court makes not just a decision about the individual um, issue at hand, which is of course the most important for the litigants, but particularly in public interest litigation, um, how a court can help develop the law um, more broadly and, and chart a course that helps the understanding of, of the executive, of the legislature, um, and of other courts in working with these concepts. So I thought I would choose two cases, one from the early on in Justice Preston's uh, career of, as chief judge of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, and, and one more recent that was mentioned in his presentation and probably most of us have heard of. The first is a 2006 case called Telstra Corporation and Hornby Shire Council. This isn't really a piece of public interest litigation. It's more about the sighting, or it is about the sighting of a uh, telephone, mobile telephone base station in a relatively leafy part of a suburb that has spotty cell phone um, connection. But the tower was to be sited in the middle of a large park light setting that was home to a recreation club where um, members of the community gathered to play various sports. And there was a concern at the time, and I'd say we've moved past this now, but a concern at the time about the um, health effects associated with the electromagnetic energy that that uh, cell phone, mobile phone facility 
might cause to residents in the surrounding area. From all appearances, reading the case, Justice Preston might tell us differently, but the lawyers and the plaintiffs and probably the defense as well did everything that was expected in preparing and presenting um, very comprehensive scientific evidence um, to support um, well-reasoned arguments that the law and particularly principles of environmentally sustainable um, development and a cautionary principle should be engaged at a time when there was a great deal of uncertainty about how it was that the cautionary principle really applied at the domestic level. And what makes this case remarkable, and I think when I mentioned the name, I think I saw Stepan nod his head. And the reason why many um, academics and lawyers, not just in New South Wales and not just in Australia, but around the world know of the case, is that Chief Justice Preston, uh, Preston takes the opportunity here to survey the law, to survey the international law, the domestic law, the interaction with the legislative framework, the academic literature, to provide a comprehensive discussion of the cautionary principle in particular that is informative, not just for the sighting of that one mobile uh, phone tower in that one particular location, but applicable to um, others who might come later who want to use the cautionary principle in a way that helps develop the law in their jurisdiction. So an active court receiving the work of plaintiffs to uh, at plaintiff's counsel and, and um, everyone involved who's done all the hard work leading up to the case to really maximize the benefit um, in, a, in a collective sort of way. The second case is the Gloucester Resources case. And I, I won't spend much time on this because I want to leave time, of course, for some questions here. But as most of us have probably heard, that case involves an application for an open cut coal mine in New South Wales that would uh, develop coal, large amounts of coal over a period of 16 years. The matter came before uh, Chief Justice Preston, New South Wales Land and Environment Court. And again, I would say this is squarely a piece of public interest litigation. The plaintiffs did their job um, the uh, Environmental Defender's Office representing um, them did their job. They provided extensive factual um, evidence, a strong legal argument, potentially an activist legal argument to encourage the court to look broadly at not just um, downstream emissions, but upstream emissions and all emissions associated with this coal mine. And Chief Justice Preston again takes the opportunity, and the reason this court, this decision has attracted headlines the world over, takes the opportunity to provide an extensive and careful examination and application of the law to the facts and to some difficult facts like causation that will help advance the legal conversation. Again, not just in relation to that one project, but in relation to um, arguments made before courts in other jurisdictions and in decision-making um, within the government and executive um, level as well. And so I just wanted to add on, we have this amazing roadmap for how, how, we, how we as lawyers should respond um, when we're preparing and advancing public interest litigation. But the world is definitely a better place when we have active courts um, receiving those arguments and um, doing some very hard work to assist everyone in understanding how the law might develop going forward. So thank you for your work, um, Just Chief Justice Preston. We are all the beneficiaries of it. Thanks for those remarks, um, Sharon. Uh, would you like to say anything in response, Justice Preston, or shall we open for questions? Um, no, I'm happy to go with questions, and um, but but thank you, um, mm -hmm. Professor. I was just going to say, um, I, I, as uh, Professor Masher was speaking, I was looking around me uh, to see if I had my excerpts from the Telstra and Gloucester Resources decisions handy. I don't have them. This isn't my usual office. 
but they are um, cases that we study carefully in law school classes uh, here in Canada. So we're going to open up for um, questions. As I said before, uh, it would be uh, fine to use the raise hand uh, button and uh, ask a question orally. Uh, and we have one already, or you can also pop a question into the chat. So um, go ahead, Milagros. Hi, um, thank you for this presentation and thank you, Justice Preston, for um, your illuminated and quite engaging presentation. I'm, I'm a lawyer uh, in Peru, but I feel like I was listening to your presentation as, as if I wasn't just trying to capture every word of it. Um, uh, so my comment, I actually have two questions, if that's OK. Uh, one, it's related to um, the question that Professor um, Sharon, I'm just going to go with the first name because that last name is quite difficult to pronounce, <laughs> um, said about the role of courts. And just following that train of thoughts, my comment is, how far do you think discretion can go? Because so far you can have, of course, amazing uh, decisions where that discretion of the court can move rights into the right direction, but you can also have that movement into the other way uh, where courts try to capture a domestic or just a, a small issue for instance, in federal Indian law in the US, when courts are trying to just see if someone is guilty of a misdemeanor and it ends up creating a concept of sovereignty or treaties or what indigenous rights are. So it's also capturing a small issue that goes beyond what was expected uh, for courts to do, but perhaps not in the right way. So my question there is how can we distinguish the, those limits of discretions among courts. And my second question, if, if I may just ask it quickly, um, I'm, this past week, I was able to actually watch a documentary that was portrayed by UBC about the necessity defense. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. I, I bet you are, of course. Um, and I was wondering what's your opinion on your take on that particular line of um, action, that some activists are now seeing that it's better to pursue a climate change action instead of going to court directly, they're trying to force the argument by play guilty of a particular um, small crime. I don't know if that's the right word and then move that into a court. Um, those are my two um, comments slash questions. I, I hope I was articulate enough for you to understand it. Right, um, let me go with the, uh, the first. You're absolutely right. Um, um, courts can make decisions that uh, environmental activists find to be um, desirable, and they can uh, make uh, decisions that, you know, viable activists find to be undesirable. Uh, that's true in all public interest litigation. If we think about it, the it's more likely that courts will make uh, what activists see to be undesirable uh, decisions. Uh, after all, that's why the litigation is being brought. Uh, the status quo has been uh, stacked against uh, the outcomes that the activists want to achieve. Um, on a completely different area, you only got to look at sometimes um, that you can have active and arguably even activist courts uh, making very conservative decisions. So the decision to overturn um, Roe versus Wade in the US Supreme Court would be a very good example um, of, um, you know, uh, regression 
I would say is an example of regression principle, not following precedent, uh, but uh, they are being uh, activists in achieving outcomes that people don't want uh, to achieve. So we go in with eyes wide open. That is probably the norm. Uh, and the question really is through uh, activists using the courts is they're trying to uh, change that uh, case by case. And um, so, in a sense, you've got to be uh, in the game to win the game. Uh, if you're not litigating, then it's likely that there will be these um, conservative and uh, regressive decisions made. Uh, so the purpose of the litigation is to try and change that agenda, uh, come up with progressive uh, and uh, decisions. Uh, so I think um, your identification that um, courts can equally, I'll put down, go the wrong way as go the right way uh, is absolutely right. Uh, but uh, you've got to uh, go in there and try and persuade them. And of course, the, you do get, um, whilst you will get some courts, especially in common law countries, not following precedent, US Supreme Court is an example in recent times, uh, mostly courts will follow precedent. So if you can get some precedent laid down, then you set the agenda uh, for future decision making. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to change the law, get those precedents so that that becomes the new normal. Um, as to the second, um, again, you're right. I said that litigation is a form of public protest. Uh, it's a protest against um, uh, the powerful, uh, those in government, those in industry, those in commerce. Uh, and there are many ways of doing it. One can do it through, um, you know, protest in the street, um, you know, Extinction Rebellion has been, you know, doing things recently. Uh, they may be these days, um, you know, picking artworks or, um, you know, container terminals or freeways or railways, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, yes, they are maybe committing some crime uh, misdemeanor at the time, but the, the whole idea is to raise public awareness and to uh, bring, pro you know, um, uh, by the protest, uh, pressure to bear on uh, those in power to change their behaviour. But equally, um, proactive litigation, that is where a plaintiff brings the action rather than being uh, reactive litigation where they're being prosecuted for committing a misdemeanor, uh, is part of the tools uh, in the uh, armory that can be used. Uh, but it should be used uh, in the appropriate situation. That's why I say, don't just take litigation in the wrong claim the wrong vehicle, the wrong facts, that's not a, a, a sensible thing. In the same way that going and doing a silly civil uh, protest, which raises uh, the annoyance of uh, society um, and, and uh, forces a, a backlash, that's not the right one either. So you've got to choose your tactic um, of protest wisely. But I think that... Um, Committing a misdemeanor is just one of the um, the tactics. It it could be successful if used um, in the right situation. I did. I do recall that uh, some extinction rebellion activists in Australia. Uh, attempted to use the sudden extraordinary emergency defense in the Queensland criminal code a few years ago, and I don't remember them succeeding with that. But I don't know if the common law defense of necessity has had success uh, when raised by protesters who've been charged with trespass or mischief or that sort of thing in Australia. It has been raised uh, in, also by um, animal rights protesters. Uh, where they've said uh, it's been unsuccessful because uh, of the uh, specificity uh, of the defence. Uh, that is, by that I mean it needs to relate to the particular person. 
It's got to be necessary uh, for them. And so they have to be uh, doing it. So the, for the animal rights protesters, there was a mismatch because it may be that it was uh, thought to be necessary to protect the animals, but that's not the person that was charged. Uh, and so the, that's been a problem. It has been successful, if I recall, in France, um, where there's been, um, it was accepted for in, in, in um, environmental activism and climate uh, change. Uh, it really will depend. But again, if, if that is a, a tactic, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I, I mean in a, a strategy, a, 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 um, a prepared decision to engage in, for example, um, committing what would be a misdemeanor in, in some way, uh, for the purpose, A, of raising public awareness, but B, perhaps, in pushing the legal boundaries. Can you raise the defence of necessity? You know, can we come up with some sort of defence? Then again, what I said in my you know, presentation applies equally. Is this the right vehicle? Is this going to be the right court? Now, we have a judicial hierarchy. <laughs> a lot of these you know, ones are going to end up before the magistrates or the local court. Are we going to get a receptive audience before those judicial officers? Perhaps not. You may go to be failing. Then will you be therefore seeking to appeal? What is in what state are you going to a province? Are you going to be uh, uh, appealing? If, if you know that you've got a very conservative appellate courts higher up, well, what's your chances of success? Right? Maybe doing a protest in that province or that state is not going to be the right one. Ah, well, there's a more liberal, uh, you know, judiciary in another province or another state. Well, what about we do it there? Or are the laws drafted in slightly different ways, which will allow that defence to be done? That may be a better place to do this. So it's an informed decision to do it. You don't just go along and, you know, today wake up and say, I'm going to strap myself to a coal loader uh, and see what, you know, happens. Well, I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get arrested. You're going to get charged. You're going to be put before a magistrate and you're going to be found uh, guilty and your defence is going to be rejected. So you've got to say, how do I change that, right? Well, Make a better decision of what it is. Look at the legislation, for example. Find the loopholes. Then say, ah, there's a there's a debate about the interpretation of that legislation. You know, if it wasn't a coal loader I went to, if I went to some other piece of infrastructure, then that may not fall within that category. I might get a defence. Well, let's go and do it to that, you know, strap myself to that piece of infrastructure. Or I'll go, um, you know, I'll choose a different person, you know, uh, who's going to be doing it. Let's find somebody who the defence is going to work better with, right? So that's the sort of, it, it, it's smart tactics. Sorry, I'll sort of try again here. We're not getting as much success um, with that. So sorry. Um, and we can um, uh, use them, I think, uh, more intelligently. Well, that is, I think, the point at which we need to draw this portion of uh, the session to a close. Before I ask you to join me in thanking Justice Preston in the uh, new manner uh, that we do on Zoom, let me just give you a couple of um, uh, notes. One is that um, this uh, virtual academy will reconvene on November 9th. We're taking a bit of a break. Uh, and on November 9th, we will hear from Mamta Ito of Nature's Rights in the UK, Marian Menezma from the Urgenda Foundation in the Netherlands, and Justice Preston mentioned the famous Urgenda decision on the Dutch uh, government's action on climate change. And then also uh, from Tony Oposa, the celebrated Philippine uh, environmental lawyer uh, who was also mentioned by Justice Preston. There's lots of time still to register to attend those sessions uh, at the website for the Academy. The other thing I want to say is uh, for any university students, so uh, whether undergraduate or postgraduate, 
um, I would encourage you to uh, consider um, participating in the second big phase of this event, which is after we finish the academy with the various um, talks, uh, we're going to have what we're calling an Inspirathon, which is a little bit of a combination of a researchathon and a hackathon brainstorming exercise where teams of students from universities anywhere in the world can enter uh, to do some research and brainstorming some proposals for how to transform countries' exclusive economic zones into enlightened ecosystem zones. And this is a challenge that has been set for us by Tony Aposa, um, and uh, we're working with him to generate information and ideas in that direction. So information about that is also on the uh, website. And now I would just say, we're going to reconvene in five minutes um, for the uh, informal chat uh, with Justice Preston and Professor Masher. For those of you who signed up in advance, you have the link to that and uh, I'll go there immediately and the rest of us you know, can take a health break as needed and uh, we'll see you in there uh, in a few minutes. And now uh, you can use the various reaction buttons or your actual hands to um, give some applause to Justice Preston. So thank you very much. I will now uh, end this meeting and we'll see some of you in a few minutes. So thank you very much, everybody.